Okay, we're going to get going. Again, um, my name's Howard Eaton. Uh, I want to welcome you to the Neuroplasticity and Education Conference. Uh, in particular, I want to thank in advance Sandra Husel, who did so much to coordinate and make this happen. Uh, and we'll thank her more afterwards, but thank you, Sandra. I think many of you were in touch with her. Uh, and she will give her big rounds of applause afterwards, but, and now maybe, so thanks, Sandra. <laughs> I tend to annoy my staff because I say, we should do this. Okay, Sandra, you do this. Uh, so I, I come up with the uh, vision, but then other amazing people make it happen. And I'm very excited to bring this group of speakers uh, together today. Uh, when we thought of uh, Neuroplasticity and Education Conference, we wanted to make it holistic and invite uh, numerous different practitioners who could contribute to make this an exciting day. Uh, bring uh, people who uh, deliver different programs like CogMed uh, to this site so we could all share in their knowledge, uh, share in the speaker's knowledge uh, from Dr. John Rady on exercise, Dr. Rick Hansen on mindfulness, uh, Barbara Aerosmith Young on cognitive uh, treatment and learning disabilities, Dr. Gabor Mate on emotional social health. Uh, uh, we're just thrilled uh, to have this group together. And I was really thrilled last night. I was able to have dinner with them. I think I had died and gone to heaven uh, as I just sat back and listened to them talk about uh, what they love, their passion, what's frustrating them as they try to implement their ideas across the world. Uh, to help reduce human suffering. And it was just a pleasure to be able to sit and listen uh, to these people. You know, I have my books around their desk, but to actually have them talking in front of me uh, was really neat. So it really is an honor to have all you here today, uh, the speakers, to be here. I'm also grateful for all of you who've chosen uh, to come here, uh, to, per to listen to the speakers, to uh, give your time, give your brain, uh, give your body uh, to this day so you can acquire new information and new insights uh, into help you, how you can help your students, your clients, uh, your own children. So I'm grateful to you to, for being here uh, and participating with us uh, today. I'm also very grateful to uh, the sponsors uh, who uh, provided money, uh, donations, so that we could offer tickets to students who didn't have the money to be here today, you know, who couldn't be here, but we were able to have sponsors who allowed us to give free tickets to high school students uh, who are in grade 12 or grade 11 who are interested in neuroscience. Uh, that was exciting for us, to have undergraduate students who have no income who wanted to be here today because they want to make it their career to be neuroscientists. So thank you to Bandidas, to Cashman Wakefield, Finlandia, Vancouver Learning Disabilities Association, Lone Calder, Our Kids, RBS, which is Richard Buells and Sutton, Sand Story, the Vancouver Observer, and the Wishing Star. Uh, without their donations, uh, we couldn't have offered uh, tickets to people who couldn't afford to be here today. So thank you to them. I want to leave a lot of time for Dr. Max Sinatter. Uh, he's a, a hero of mine in his uh, promotion and his um, keen interest in the brain. Uh, I've known Max for a long time. Initially, it was with uh, the Dyslexia Association in Vancouver uh, back in 1995, I think it was, uh, when I moved back here from Massachusetts after being an uh, elementary teacher. I was asked to run a conference for the Dyslexia Association uh, on dyslexia, and Dr. Max Sinatter at the time was investigating uh, the genetic components of dyslexia, and he was gracious to give his time and speak uh, uh, for our association. So I've known him a long time. Uh, he's an amazing speaker, uh, but most of all, he's just a really kind person. Uh, I'm going to read a bit of his bio, and then I'm going to invite him up to the stage. Uh, Dr. Max Sinatter is director of the Brain Research Center and the Javid, uh, Javad 
Moafagian Center for Brain Health at Vancouver General Coastal Health and the University of British Columbia. In addition, he holds the Canadian Research Chair in Brain Development at UBC and is a professor of ophthalmology. He is also a member of the Order of Canada, member of the Order of British Columbia, fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, fellow of the Canadian Academy for Health Sciences, and is a principal investigator in Canada's network of excellence in stroke. Um, I don't know how he does this, um, but he does. So uh, please come up, uh, Dr. Max Sinatter. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you very much, uh, Howard, for that, uh, that generous introduction. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, be here uh, today and uh, to speak with you. You know, as one uh, goes on in life, uh, uh, you get asked your opinion about things you know less and less about. And uh, so last year I was asked uh, of, by a sports organization to give a talk on uh, how to grow an Olympian. And uh, I thought, okay, well, this is so in some unguarded moment I said yes. Uh, and as I was getting the talk together, I realized that uh, really uh, in trying to answer the question of how you optimize the performance of Olympic athletes, uh, it's really not any different than the process of uh, how you optimize the performance of a high school student or uh, a child with learning disabilities or any of us. And so uh, what I'm going to do is give you a somewhat uh, different version of that talk. You might notice little hints of the Olympics creeping through in the talk, and that's just a vestige of, uh, uh, of, of the origin of this talk. But uh, so the, the title uh, is really... Uh, uh, maximizing the potential of the brain, um, and um, so how, how can we maximize the potential of the brain? What are the determinants of the brain's potential? Well, you know, you always have to start at the beginning, um, and I believe that when they write uh, the intellectual history of uh, this period, um, that they're going to say that this is the time, and you know, and in this century that we decoded the human genome, that we figured out what the building blocks of our cells, of our body, are made of. Um, there are 20,000 human genes. It's actually quite interesting. There aren't really any, we don't have any more genes than worms. We actually have fewer genes than rice. Um, but, which I think is kind of strange. Uh, what's interesting is that of those 20,000 genes, probably two-thirds of them are used to either grow or operate your brain. So, you know, that tells you that our brain is nearly as complicated as is rice, which is <laughs> kind of interesting. So obviously, uh, you know, your, your genetics uh, is an important part of your potential. And some people are just lucky enough to draw uh, the genetics royal flushes. And uh, here's one example of a guy who, you really just have to look at Mike Phelps uh, uh, to realize that this is, he's an unusual specimen. Just look at his torso, look at the length of his arms, you can see it in the, the size of his hands. This is an individual who is an outstanding, a uh, well-endowed person. Of course he trains, of course he does all the things he has to do, but he starts with a huge advantage. And clearly, uh, that's something that, uh, you know, uh, we should all hope for. And uh, what I tell people is to make sure that you choose the best set of parents that you possibly can. <laughs> um, now, the, the next slide uh, uh, shows you another uh, amazing athlete. Uh, if you know who this person is, uh, don't tell us. Just hold up your hand. Do you know who it is? 
Almost no one does. Anyway, this is another person who is, uh, uh, turns out to have, uh, he has amazing cognitive gifts, and I'll tell you who he is at the end of the talk. Uh, but the point is that genetic uh, endowment uh, uh, can happen in many different domains, and if you remember that most of your genome is really used to run your brain, uh, of course, you expect genetic effects uh, in cognition and the capabilities of your brain. So, you say, great, okay, well, that's, that's very nice to know, Max. What can I actually do with this? Well, you know, I want to tell you a little bit at the beginning of this talk about another field that is related to genetics, uh, which is coming along just as fast. So the genetic revolution is upon us. You can get your entire exome sequenced in our center for $700 today. Um, it's going to get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. In a decade or two, the kid that walks into your school, if you're an educator, if he's, you know, if he lives in, you know, the ritzier parts of town, will probably have had his genome sequenced. And that information, parents will come to you with a little, you know, memory stick. This is my kid's DNA, and what are you going to do for him? And I think that, well, you know, don't, you, know, you may chuckle, but, uh, but wait. <laughs> We've all dealt with parents, I'm sure. Um, so, um, moving along rapidly uh, behind the field of genetics, which is hurtling forward, uh, is another field that I want to tell you about, which is called epigenetics. Epigenetics is, while genetics deals with the genome that you have, that you are given at the instant you are conceived, epigenetics, if I can just express it in one sentence, is the science of how things that happen to you, how the environment impacts your genome. Because the environment does impact your genome, it doesn't change the sequence of DNA that you've got. That's there from the beginning and will be there till the end, unless you have cancer and things mutate. But epigenetics is the process by which the environment modifies your genome, not by changing its sequence, but by changing how it is actually read out. So what do I mean by this? Well, let me give you an example. Take a look at your hand, okay? Look at your hand, and look at your second finger, this one, your in index finger and your ring finger, and compare the length of your, the second finger and the fourth finger. It turns out uh, that that's, uh, on average, different between men and women. Men tend to have a longer fourth finger than a second finger, and uh, women it's more equal. But it turns out this is an epigenetically regulated phenomenon, okay? It will predict, for instance, by looking at the ratio of your second and fourth finger, you can predict a man's risk of prostate cancer, okay? By looking at the ratio of the second and fourth finger, uh, you can predict a woman's mental toughness in athletics. There are all kinds of things that you find out. What actually happens? It is kicked off by an epigenetically regulated surge of testosterone, which happens somewhere at the end of the second trimester in the fetus. It organizes your hand, and that same surge of testosterone organizes your brain. So people whose fourth and second fingers are, uh, you know, more divergent are more of a, more risk takers. People whose uh, people in whom the uh, uh, shape is more, the length is more equal, are are less likely to take risks. So there's all sorts. Of, so we are now discovering that this epigenetic, these epigenetic processes, are really the way in which experiences get under your skin. And we know that early inputs, hormones, in this case testosterone, what you eat, what happens to you, your stressors, 
that they affect brain development. And then we also know that your brain development affects your, develop, your later development, just as your development affects the brain, and that leads to changes in brain function. And these developmental trajectories predict success or failure, and they also predict your health. So it's, it's quite a profound thing. The field is advancing at a furious rate. So just to remind you of uh, you know, some examples of bad things that can happen to you in life, family violence, sexual abuse, addiction, loss of one parent for any reason, 50 times greater risk of suicide, 50 times greater risk of addiction, three times greater risk of heart disease, diabetes, hypertension. All these negative outcomes stem from adverse early experiences which we believe are mediated through epigenetic modifications uh, of your genetic processes. So how does it actually work? When the chromosome, it, there's the chromosome in the bottom, that's this uh, X-like structure. So you know the DNA makes RNA, makes protein, okay? That's been known for a long time. It turns out that when, that not all DNA is busy making RNA and protein in every cell in your body all the time. So you've got 20,000 genes, but only some of your genes are turned on in some cells in your body. So there are a different group of genes turned on in your eye, a different group of genes turned on in your ear, different group of genes turned on in your brain, different group of genes turned on in your big toe, different genes turned on in young people and in old people, different group of genes turned on in a neuron that's plastic, versus a neuron that's not plastic. We're busy act understanding this, and the process by which they are regulated, whether they are allowed to be on or off, or partially on or partially off, is regulated by this epigenetics here. And you, you see those little uh, brown coils, they're little methyl groups, uh, and what they do is they, when they attach themselves to a gene, they basically control whether it's being read or not. Most of the genome, probably over 90%, is actually devoted not to actually making RNA and proteins, but it's devoted to controlling, orchestrating which genes are on or off at a particular time and in a particular cell. The way I actually think of the genome is like a piano. So we got 20,000 genes, and imagine that Imagine a chord, a 20,000 gene keyboard, okay? And what happens is, under some circumstances, you're playing one chord, one genetic chord. Some fraction of those genes are on. And under other circumstances, you're playing a different chord. That's how it actually seems to work. And understanding that process is what people are doing at a fantastic rate. We have in our center now a single chip that can look at 480,000 of these uh, methylation sites, those little brown sites all at once. And it's just getting cheaper, better, more powerful. So we're going to be in a world where not only is your genome going to be sequenced, but your epigenome is going to be interrogated. Now at some level the epigenome is much more complicated because it's not constant. Your genome stays with you. You get sequenced once, you've got it. Your epigenome changes. It changes during pregnancy, changes as you grow up, changes as you get old. The same genome leads to many different epigenomes. We're working on this. One of, one of the groups in our center is looking, is using this 480,000 uh, 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 point uh, methylation array uh, to develop a uh, test for fetal alcohol syndrome. We think we can identify kids right when they emerge. Not when they're 18 and they've, they've already you know, spent a year in jail. We think we can identify them right then. Everything we know about brain plasticity says if you want to change the brain, it's good to start early. And so identifying early, early diagnosis, early robust and accurate diagnosis is the key uh, to improving uh, outcomes. We're also working, uh, another group in our center is working on an epigenetic test for concussion. So after an athlete uh, walks off the field and says, I'm fine, coach, uh, 
You can't believe that. Um, so people are working now uh, to use the power of epigenetics because that causes changes in your brain uh, and those changes can be uh, interrogated using this kind of technology. So here's one example uh, of how early experiences affect the life course. What we're looking at here are high socioeconomic status physicians. Uh, they all graduated from medical school and you're looking at their cumulative risk of heart disease. It turns out if you come from a low socioeconomic status family in childhood, that affects your health outcomes for the rest of your life. Again, we believe that this is mediated through epigenetic processes and this is all being studied in our center. So, the advice is not only do you have to choose good parents, you have to make sure that you've got a healthy epigenome. And we're working hard to understand exactly what that is. I think that the, we are in very early days of this, but I think it's important that you understand uh, what the possibilities actually are. Okay, so let's talk about brain plasticity now. So what is brain plasticity? Well, brain plasticity is the process by which the brain changes as a result of how it is used or misused, as a result of the input that it receives. Brain plasticity includes memory, but it also includes things like learning a new skill, uh, recovering from brain damage, uh, basically anything that changes your brain. If you remember this lecture tomorrow, and I, I hope you will, uh, it will be uh, because of brain plasticity. So let, let's talk about memory for a moment. It's arguably one of the most crucial features of brain plasticity aspects. So what's a memory anyway? What is a memory? Let me submit to you that a memory is nothing more than your ability to recreate the whole from a degraded fragment. It's just that. So what do I, what do I actually mean by that? Let's, think, let's get concrete. Let's think about the memory of your grandmother. Okay? So, you probably haven't seen your grandmother for a long time. She may already be dead, who knows? You see these points of light inside your brain, what they're meant to do is to represent the different patterns of activity associated with your grandmother. So back here is the visual cortex, the spots of light over here represent how she looked. Over here is the auditory cortex, that's the sound of her voice. Over there is the uh, touch cortex, the somatosensory cortex. It represents, you know, the rustle, you know, the, the feeling of her clothes, the touch of her skin. Over there on the front is the smell cortex at the bottom, uh, and it's, it's the smell of the cookies that she baked. So if there's one thing that you should remember and take home from this speech, it's the following. Neurons that fire together, wire together. This is an expression first coined by Simon LeVay some 30 years ago, but it's true. That's the rule. Neurons that fire together do wire together. Contiguity breeds connectivity. So let's go back to your grandmother. As you interact with your grandmother over the years, all these different aspects of your grandmother are being experienced by your brain at the same time, okay? So at the same time as you see her and activity, and activity happens in the visual cortex, you get activity in the auditory cortex, you hear her voice, you, uh, s you, know, you smell her cookies, you, uh, you know, feel her skin, all these things happen at the same time. And what happens is that neurons that fire together wire together and highways are formed in your brain connecting all these points of light. And as those highways are formed by neurons firing together and wiring together, basically you get this assembly of activity. And here's the great thing. Later on, you can enter this circuit at any point. So you haven't seen your grandma grandmother in a long time. 
uh, you're walking along in the lobby of the Western Bayshore, and you pass uh, the coffee shop, and you smell something. You know what? It's the cookies that your grandmother used to bake. It's the same smell. And kapow, she's all there. What she looks like, the sound of her voice, uh, the texture of her skin, all of the attributes of your grandmother can be evoked from this one degraded fragment. Not only can they be evoked, they are evoked. And this is what we think memory is. And this is what we think plasticity actually is. It is the process by which these highways are formed, by which connections in the brain are strengthened, and we think that this is absolutely critical to the learning process, the process by which you learn factoids, by which you learn skills, by which you recover from damage, because when you have damage, it's these connections, it's these pathways that are disrupted. So, how does it actually work? We're in the middle of a revolution in neuroscience. We have an amazing ability to observe and manipulate the brain. What we've done here is we've taken two neurons inside the brain of a mouse and we've put into them a gene that we got from jellyfish. We, got, we borrowed it from a jellyfish and it's the gene that allows a jellyfish to glow green. Okay? So now these neurons glow green. We only put it into these two neurons because if we put it into everybody, the whole slide would just look green. But that enables us to see these two neurons. You see the cell body of one neuron, it's called a soma. You see the axon, that's the sending end of the neuron. And it's making a connection, a synapse, uh, with, uh, at the terminal with the neuron on the right. We can see synapses now, again, in ways that we just couldn't see before. Here's another neuron. We've painted it green, and we've painted uh, the excitatory synapses in green. You can see them, and the inhibitory synapses in red. We can, we can see these things in ways that were just not possible at all five years ago. So what we can actually do is we can force two neurons to fire together. We can take the neuron on the left, and we can tickle it, and then we can record the response of the neuron on the right. So we tickle the neuron on the left, we record the response of the neuron on the right. You know, neurons fire, they go pop, 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 pop. You can play it on your loudspeaker if you have no life at all. Uh, and uh, uh, I've actually been known to do this for hours on, e on end, actually. Uh, anyway, um, you can measure the strength of the connection between the neuron on the left and the neuron on the right to start with. And you can give it a number, a value. And then what you do is you tickle the neuron on the left, and immediately afterwards you tickle again, you tickle the neuron on the right, you go bang, 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 bang. You force them to fire together. Fire, 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 fire. And as long as you do this within one-tenth of a second, fire, 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 you do it a few hundred times, it doesn't take long. What you find at the end of it is that the connection between those two neurons has strengthened and it stays stronger for hours. If you do it every day, you know, over and over again, it gets stronger and stronger and more and more robust and lasts longer and longer. You can literally see how neurons that fire together wire together. We're all over this in our center. We're trying to understand what the actual mechanism is because ultimately what we want to do is to enhance neuroplasticity. We want to enhance the ability of these two neurons to come together. So this is the synapse the connection between the two neurons. This is the, you know, the neuron on the left is releasing the transmitter and there are receptors and the neuron on the right that respond. This is how we imagined synapses maybe 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, this is a slightly more realistic view uh, of the synapse once the Human Genome Project has done its work. It's like before we were just, we're, we're truly in the dark ages. Now we discover that there are actually hundreds of proteins at the synapse. It turns out that something like 3% of your genome is devoted to synapses. Who knew? Nobody knew, but it's true. So over here now, you see those little balls up there on the top? That's the transmitter coming from one neuron, and those uh, orange and green and blue uh, blobs, if I can use that term, are the receptors. And the way in which we now understand how synapses get stronger, 
what happens is whenever a, an input, those little blue blobs, whenever they're successful, what they actually do is they activate these receptors, the receptors respond, they activate all of this other stuff underneath them, and then if the synapse is repeatedly successful, what you do is you stick more of these receptors, the AMPA receptor, NMDA, and the MGLUR uh, receptor, you stick more of these receptors into that synapse. And what that means is that later on, the same amount of transmitter is being greeted by more receptors, and so the response gets stronger. Same, same transmitter, more receptors, stronger response. And we're all over this in our center. There are people whose only job it is to understand you know, the relationship between Homer and Shank over there on the right of that slide. That's a PhD thesis. These things are turning out to be incredibly important. If you block the interaction between the NMDA receptor and PSD95, you see it over there on that slide, um, you save 90% of the brain cells that would otherwise die after a stroke. So this is a very active field of research. And so you see neurexin. I don't know if you can see neuroligin or not, but it turns out mutations in neurexins and neuroligin predispose to autism. So these are you know, changes in these actors, which we finally are now starting to understand, are clearly related to all sorts of learning disabilities and to the learning process, and uh, people are working hard to understand what to do. Of course, this is going to lead to drugs. We already have a drug called modafinil. Have you heard of it? Hands? It turns out, apparently, about 20% of American students taking the MCAT or LSAT exams are now doing this under the influence of modafinil. It was originally uh, discovered and prescribed as a narcolepsy drug. There aren't that many people with narcolepsy. The sales are off the charts. It is widely, widely misused. Is it fair? What it does is it increases the release of glutamate. You see those little blue uh, uh, dots up there? It increases transmitter release. Okay. There are, um, I, actually I should go back here. Um, there are other drugs that will change the, the effectiveness of your synapses that are coming down the pipe. There's a whole class of drugs called ampokines. You see the AMPA receptor, uh, A-M-P-A-R, uh, to basically increase the efficiency of that receptor. So these things will be coming down the pipe, and they will be used. In some cases, they will be misused, but you guys may well be in the front line because it will be parents and it will be children who will be uh, wanting to use these kinds of uh, instruments. Now, I should tell you that while drugs will be important and they will continue to advance, the most powerful way we have of modifying synapses is behavior. Do not forget behavior. <laughs> Whether you call it rehabilitation in a patient who suffered a stroke or special education or the Aerosmith program or what have you, behavior is the most powerful way we have of changing synapses. And the way I see these kinds of molecular tools is I see them as adjuncts to behavior, not as replacing training programs, well-designed training programs. I think there's a huge opportunity of bringing these kinds of things together. So let me just tell you about another thing that happens to a successful synapse. By the way, it's like Facebook. You know that? There's 100 billion neurons. You know, each neuron talks to about 10,000 other neurons. Uh, they have about 10,000 Facebook friends. And if a neuron is successful, so you see that neuron on the top, it's making a connection to the neuron on the bottom, that's the synapse. If the synapse is successful, the neuron that's receiving the input sends a little jolt of growth factor back to the sending neuron. And what that does is it cements the connection. That's part of the mechanism by which the connection is strengthened for the long term. And it also tells that sending neuron, you are a success, I like you. Uh, and what that does is it gives it the motive force to grow the rest of its axon. The other thing it does is to strengthen the wrapping of the myelin. You see that yellow myelin over there? 
that also gets stronger. That makes the transmission more secure and faster. Faster is very important in sports. People will kill for five milliseconds, and that's uh, what you get uh, from a stronger connection. So you can actually see this in action. So here, uh, many of you know about the tremendous imaging technology that's available for the brain now. We can now identify the various areas of the cortex. So these are 32 areas in the monkey visual cortex. They're all devoted to vision. I won't tell you what their jobs are. It's, it's too, long a, a, too long a talk. But what I, what I can show you is uh, area V1. I think of the cortex, by the way, as sort of a it's really a little sheet. It's about two millimeters thick. It's about, if you unfold it, it's a little smaller than this lectern that's in front of me. And it's got all these different areas laid out on it. If you look at the surface of the visual cortex, what you see is that in a normal human or a normal animal, the two eyes actually occupy parallel sheets across the surface, parallel lines across the surface of the cortex. Now, what happens if one of those inputs is used and another input is not used? Remember, if one input is used, it makes successful synapses, it makes connections, it gets stronger, it grows faster, it grows more. This is what happens. You cover one eye of a young monkey for a couple of weeks, and instead of each part of the cortex, the black and white lines represent the left and right eye. Instead of each eye having 50% of the cortex, oh no, the eye that was used outgrows, outcompetes the other eye and takes over the cortex. So inputs that are not interesting, that are not fun, lose their friends if they don't sell useful information. And this now, it turns out, is happening at another level, so you see those 32 cortical areas? If one of them is boring, because it doesn't tell a good story to everybody else, what we, can f what we find is that it is actually disconnected from the rest of the cortical network. And then the wires just bypass it. It just has no friends. Everybody ignores it. Very, very important. We believe that many cases of learning disability will turn out to be related to this. That you will either have a genetic predisposition to having an area or an input that is too weak, that is not strong enough, and if we don't do anything about it, that input will get weaker. You know, the rich get richer, the strong get stronger, the weak lose out. So we're gonna have to figure out ways to identify those weak pathways and to strengthen them. Here's another example in the motor cortex. So this is your motor cortex, and it has a map of the body surface laid out across its surface in the gray matter. So if you look in the, uh, you know, if I was to take an electrode and stick it in the area labeled foot, the foot area, and I go zap, you'll kick. Your foot will move. If I pull it out, and then stick it in the other side of the cortex over there at the tongue area, same electrodes, same current, same everything, just different place. Stick it in the tongue area, zap, and you'll go, you'll stick your tongue out. So there is a map of your motor output laid out across the surface of the cortex. Now one of the interesting things about this map is that it is not isotropic, it is not the same everywhere. So if you look at how much cortex you've got devoted to your thumb. Look at it, it's huge. You have more cortex devoted to your thumb uh, than you do uh, to your entire foot, for, a, for instance, and your foot is way bigger, or your back, <laughs> okay? It turns out that this can be affected by your experience, by usage. So if you look in the cortex of a piano player, you find they have a bigger representation of the fingers. And everything else is like, you know, basically squashes, squashed away, pushed away to make room for this expanded representation. If we take a monkey and we basically glue two of the fingers together, actually we tape them together for a couple weeks so they can't be used, what you find is that the representation of those two fingers shrinks in the cortex within a couple of weeks. 
if you force the monkey to use one finger over and over and over again in a reaching task where only that finger will do, the representation of that finger grows. So all of this is brain plasticity. It is related to successful firing, and then after, uh, after that, a successful synapse promotes growth. And that growth is what you see in these kinds of things. I'm not gonna have time to do this, Howard, okay? I'll just skip through this, okay? But uh, if you ask me later, I will tell you about the focused and unfocused brain, because it's a very exciting area of research. But what I want to stay with now is the, our ability to actually see the pathways in the brain. We now have unbelievable imaging technologies that were simply not available even five years ago. So what you can see inside the head now is the actual wires of the brain, the actual pathways. How does it work? Well, you actually measure the local diffusion of water. That's what it actually measures. And what happens is, if the water is inside the axon and the axon is going, say, straight up and down, the water will tend to diffuse straight up and down along the axon and not across the axon, because the axon's very narrow. So if you know this, you can actually map out, using uh, uh, advanced MRI imaging techniques, you can map out the highways of the brain. And you can see how they're affected, for instance, in Congresswoman Gifford when a bullet goes through them, because uh, not only, like, try to imagine a situation in which a bullet or a, you know, an earthquake happens and you just take out West Georgia. Uh, what do you do after that? Well, you're gonna have to reorganize, you're gonna do your best, um, but being able to see it and being able to see whether pathways in this next child's brain are as strong as they ought to be is going to turn out to be very important. So people are studying these pathways in normals and adults. They're studying this in development. They're identifying networks. So back to those 32 cortical areas, we've now identified a network that seems to be organized to tell you where something is where it is, where it's going, it doesn't tell you that much about it, but it tells you what's happening to it, whether you should avoid it, whether you should catch the ball or do things like that. And there's another network that tells you a lot about what it is, the fine detail of it. So these two parallel networks have now been identified operating in those 32 visual areas. Here's another amazing uh, uh, set of discoveries. By looking at these connectivity maps within the brain, we've identified an area or a network called the default network. You may have heard of it. Some people call it the daydreaming network. It's the network that turns on when you're thinking of nothing. It's the network that turns on when you're not paying attention to the external world. So what's shocking about this network, so it's really pretty interesting now to discover it and there look like there are gonna be several variants on it. But what's scary about it is if you look at where the plaques and tangles form in Alzheimer's disease, it is first and foremost, you see, the blue is the default network and the red are the, is the distribution of plaques and tangles in an early case of Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is a disease of the default network. Okay, so anyway, that's not my purpose today, but uh, but just to tell you that our ability to see these networks in action is, is going to help us to understand not only diseases like Alzheimer's disease, but learning disabilities, like anomalies of cognition, people who don't behave the way you expect them to, uh, and who uh, have difficulties uh, in early life and also in later life. So it's great to see these things, but the next thing that we really want to do is to manipulate them. And there is a technology uh, that is uh, coming to the fore, and Howard was just talking about uh, uh, working uh, with one of the members of our center named Dr. Lara Boyd, who's a pioneer in this area. It's basically transcranial magnetic stimulation is a technology that enables you to stimulate particular areas of the brain through the skull. Okay, so you. Uh, basically, you know, stick this uh, probe onto the head uh, and you can exercise particular parts of the brain. 
This is what it actually looks like. You know, you don't have to be anesthetized. You're sitting in the apparatus. Uh, you can be doing a task. You can be reading a book. You can be, uh, uh, you know, uh, playing uh, computer games. Uh, while all this is happening, we look into the brain and we know where, where we're stimulating. Remember, we can identify pathways in the brain. We can see whether the pathways are as strong as they should be or too weak or maybe too strong. And then we think we can strengthen individual pathways. How do we do it? Simple. Neurons that fire together, wire together. Just as I showed you how we exercise those two neurons, stimulate the neuron on the left, and then look at the response of the neuron on the right, we can do that on a larger scale. We have a multi-channel transcranial magnetic stimulation system. The pathway from A to B is too weak. What do we do? We go A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B. A, B, A, B. We do it a couple hundred times. We pair it with behavior. We pair it with training. You call it rehab if you're dealing with a stroke patient. You call it special ed if you're dealing with a kid with uh, uh, you know, behavioral or learning problems. But we put these things together and we come out, hopefully, uh, with stronger pathways. I can tell you that uh, in the lab, it's looking very promising, very exciting. And, uh, you know, right now, you're just seeing it in the one or two channel mode, but I see a future in which we're going to have many uh, stimulating points in the brain where we have the ability to really recreate the memory of your grandmother, if you want. <laughs> or in some cases, if we do it wrong, uh, we may be able to get people to forget uh, by, if you stimulate things. Remember, the obverse is true also. Neurons that don't fire together don't wire together and can even dewire together. So one of the jokes around our lab is we're going to figure out a way to get people to forget Tom Cruise. <laughs> that will be true success when you understand enough of the memory of Tom Cruise to be able to eliminate him. And I think, I think you'll all agree that that is a worthy societal goal. Um, so uh, all of this is happening in our new Javad Moafagian Center for Brain Health which is under construction and opening in one month, God help me, uh, on the UBC campus. It is a fantastic new facility uh, that brings together all of the kinds of things I've been talking about, neuroplasticity, genetics, imaging, uh, patient populations, uh, researchers, all in one state-of-the-art facility. Uh, without sounding too arrogant, I can tell you that our neuroscience community in Canada is, in Vancouver is, the best in Canada and actually very competitive worldwide. This facility is all part of it and is the next evolution of our community. I think it's something that's going to make a huge difference uh, not to dealing with the diseases of the brain and uh, advancing our understanding of brain plasticity. So just to close, uh, hockey season is just starting and uh, this great Canadian philosopher teaches us that what we have to do is to stay constantly ahead of the curve. And that's what conferences like this are all about. It's telling us what's coming down the pipe, pipe, where that puck is actually going to be. We have to get there and be ready to meet it. And finally, just want to close with uh, a slide of that uh, great athlete that I showed you, <laughs> Albert Einstein. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>